Everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Dingo Talk, where we explore the experiences that make us who we are. Here's your host, Carlo Guadagnino. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk, and welcome to week nine of the college football season. Uh, this week, we are focusing on Keene University and their head coach, Dan Garrett. Um, we're going to talk to Coach Garrett about his time in the GFL over in Nuremberg, um, his time at Montclair State, and then obviously from 2006 to present, he's been at the helm of Keene. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Keene is in the NJAC, which is the New Jersey Athletic Conference. Um, I really wanted to talk about the fact that it's already week nine, and I'm sure Serenity and I will talk about it as well because she brought the comment up about how, wow, the season's like that. Um, speaking of, she had a pretty big week. There's a tie for second place now for the superiority of picks. DB obviously still sitting very comfortably in his lead. We'll talk about that. We'll make our picks. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, listening to us on Spotify, or watching us on Spotify, really appreciate you. Uh, tell a friend to tell a friend. And then make sure you follow all the social medias. That's Facebook, Instagram, X, and TikTok. The only one that's different is the Instagram page. Uh, it's dingo underscore talk. Um, but without further ado, have a happy and safe Halloween weekend. And this is Dan Garrett. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head football coach at Keene University, uh, Coach Dan Garrett. Coach, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being on with you. I appreciate it, Carlo. Absolutely, Coach. This is a busy time for you. I'm sure camp is in full swing, so I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Uh, no place else I'd rather be. I have a wife and three kids, but love what I do still. And uh, even though I miss them, this is day three of camp, and I we are in full camp mode. So, Coach, we're going to do this the same way we do every every week. I'm going to take you back in the time machine, bring you, bring you back to your playing days, and we're going to work our way through. So my question for you, being from New Jersey, how'd you yep. find your way to Montclair State? Yeah, what, what people don't know about me either, I, I had a high school, I grew up in Clifton. Um, I'm from Clifton, New Jersey, and at a high school, I went to a Division II school named Millersville, Pennsylvania. Uh, okay. So Clifton is, is one of the biggest cities in New Jersey. And um, I went out there as a quote unquote, not a true city boy, not New York City, but uh, city enough. And I go out to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The people out there were wonderful. Uh, the experience was amazing for me, but it was just, you know, it was vastly different. And Montclair State literally is is the next town over from where I grew up. <clears throat> and when I transferred from Millersville in the spring of 93, I was looking at two schools, Montclair State right up the road or Rowan at the time, Glassboro State, then turned Rowan. Um, they were, uh, you know, they were the beast of the East. They were really doing a lot of good things. And I chose to, to eventually stay home uh, to mm -hmm. play for Rick Ginicola. And uh, the rest is history. Now, why was Montclair the, the, the right fit for you? Um, you know, when I talked to Coach Ginicola, I went to Millersville. Um, you know, I played both ways in high school, offensive line, defensive line. And I went to Millersville Division Two, and they had some monsters. And you're talking to PSAC, a perennial powerhouse in Division Two football. Uh, I'm a big guy, 6'2". I was about 250 out of high school. But then I was all of a sudden a very, very small guy around some guys out there. A uh, good friend of mine now, Joe Pyro, who lives in Nutley, took care of me. Monster. Uh, Faulkner was a 6'7", you know, 310-pound tackle. Um, I wanted to play defense. Uh, and, mm -hmm. I, and God rest his soul, I played for Gene A. Car Carpenter at Millersville. He's a Hall of Fame. He's a legend. Um, you know, I, I went in there that first spring and said, Coach, I'd love to be able to switch to uh, defense. And he said, Son, we scholarship you as an offensive lineman. You're a center, and that's what you're saying. And after a long debate, um, I wanted to play defense. Rick Ginicola gave me that opportunity to transfer in as a defensive end. Uh, and eventually I moved to, you know, linebacker in my career there. And, and that's why. It was a great fit. Now, it's interesting. I'm going to get a little ahead of myself. It's interesting when you talk about – I've talked to other coaches and we talk about the importance of Division Three. And the difference being that you're not necessarily a hostage by a financial obligation or that piece of paper that got you into school. Um, it's interesting that you kind of shed light on that is we scholarship you as an offensive lineman, as a center, that's where you're going to play. And, and uh, sorry about your luck. And so division three gave you the opportunity to, to go to that other side of the ball and be the guy, the player that you wanted to be. So I got my next question leads me to I got to ask you about Nur 
Nuremberg. And I got I want to ask you about uh, the Trenton Lightning. So let's yep. start with uh, Germany, because I'm guessing as a big guy, you were probably a, uh, one of the bigger guys walking around in Germany. You know, it's funny. It was really, you know, it was, you know, so when I got done playing in Montclair in 1996, like I was chasing a dream like everyone else does when, you know, I was football, football, football. I couldn't imagine my life without football. You know, at the time I'm, I was traveling all over the East Coast to, to AFL tryouts for the Arena League. There was all different startup leagues that never took off the ground. I was trying really hard. You know, NFL wasn't for me. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, I was division three. I wasn't Sam Mills. So, you know, I had a year off of football from playing and I was still coaching at Montclair and a buddy of mine, um, Ralph Sinkew, who I went to high school with was also at Montclair state signed with a team in Germany. And now uh, he went over there um, in early March. He mm -hmm. calls me up um, right before Easter, late March, 1997. Never forget it. He goes, hey, you want to come over and play football in Germany? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, they need a linebacker. I said, I didn't hesitate. I said, yeah, just tell me where to sign. And the coach got in touch with me. The general manager got in touch with me. I signed all the paperwork. And it was probably one of the, the greatest experiences of my, my young adult life because when you grow up in Clifton, New Jersey, and you travel thousands and thousands of miles overseas at the time, you know, we didn't have internet yet. You know, I, I couldn't get on a Zoom to see mom and dad or my baby brother or, or a call like we're doing now on my phone and be on a FaceTime. You know, so you learn a lot about yourself and there's a lot of self-reflection. Um, and I spent April there till right before camp um, when I reported to camp at Montclair State somewhere mid-August. And, and it was phenomenal. It was a great opportunity. Um, you know, a guy like me not only played linebacker. And like you said, I was one of the bigger guys because our job there, when you play in Germany for the GFL, your job is also to teach, you know, the, the, the locals, the Europeans, the Germans how to play football. So mm -hmm. we had uh, four Americans on the team, two on offense, two on defense. Um, you know, there was one game I was a gunner on punt, you know, I would never be a gunner at Montclair state. You know, we had wide outs and DBs for that. So, you know, the next week I'm playing fullback in a short yardage situation. So it's, it was really cool, man. It was a great feeling. It's definitely different. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I, I would do it again at, at 24, 25 years old in a heartbeat. Um, and it was a phenomenal experience. And then Trenton lightning was, you know, it was a little different. It gave me another opportunity because I had a, a short cup of coffee with the Red Dogs, and, and you know, I just wasn't big enough for that Mac AFL linebacker fullback back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and Trenton Lightning was a little bit of a, a, a tail off of the AFL. And you know, the interesting thing about that, you know, that's four years later. You know, that's that's a, in the spring winter of 2001. You know, I'm getting married in May of 2001, uh, and uh, I'm playing football, uh, and I'm like. You know, what am I doing? I'm getting married in May, playing a game in April. <laughs> God forbid I get my face busted up. Uh, I might not have a wife to marry. So um, all great experiences. And just like anything else, this game of football, it's really amazing, man. It just brings people from all walks of life, whether you're overseas mm -hmm. in Germany or I'm in Trenton playing with guys I might have competed against uh, at the Division three level. You know, it's such a bond and a brotherhood that I still talk to those guys, especially from the Trenton Lightning today. It, you know, it's just built such incredible, unbreakable bonds, this game, and it's just amazing. Now, Coach, you, you, you touched on why when you were coming back from Germany, you're also starting your coaching career uh, at your alma mater. Is there anything or any advice to uh, seniors that are finishing up their careers playing-wise this year that want to make that transition to being the guy with the khakis and the and the cool visor and the whistle, and you're not the guy. You're not the guy running anymore. You're the guy telling someone to run. Um, yeah. How does that dynamic work out? Work itself out. You know, the one thing, and I don't regret anything, right? I, I was I was fortunate. Like Rick Nicola, who who I love, he was my mentor, uh, and then we competed against one another as head coaches. Um, when he asked me when I was done with my football career playing for him, um, he said, "You want to coach?" And I didn't hesitate. I said, "Absolutely." Like it, it wasn't like, "Hey, how much?" It wasn't, hey, you know, what am I doing? I just said yes. And whatever he told me to do, whatever the contract was at the time, I think I coached linebackers my first year for a $2,000 part-time stipend. But, you know, I was probably up there, you know, 50, 60 hours a week. So, you know, the advice I would give you, which is vastly different in today's world, um, no matter what job they give you, don't worry about the money. If you want to build a profession, you build a network with the people where you are and you work the, the hardest you can where you're at, no matter the level, and people are going to take recognition and notice. Uh, as opposed to chasing a logo or a salary. Like, um, you know, when you talk about starting my career, you know, as we get into it, um, I had a choice to make in 2003 um, to go into Port Authority Police Academy with my younger brother at the same academy. Um, and Port Authority Police is a big deal out here. You know, it's, it's a great job. It's a great pension, all those things. And, and it's a, a pretty good salary. Or take a job at Kane at the time for 29000 And then my, my family is all Port Authority people on the dad's side. 
you know, so I basically took almost a seventy, eighty thousand dollar pay cut and guaranteed that I would be um, retired in 20 years versus mm -hmm. going to chase my passion. Right. And take a job as a D coordinator for twenty nine thousand dollars. So I would say, man, don't worry about the salary. Do your job. Do the best you can with wherever you are. And people are going to take notice regardless of salary. Build your network and, and, and be genuine, be sincere and just work your tail off. Now, why was in 2003, why was it time to move? Obviously, I mean, getting the D.C. spot, that's that's that step below being the head coach. What, was that the only mot motivating factor or was it just time to move on? Well, again, it was a it was a pivotal time in my life. So, I mean, in, in 2003, uh, I just got married. Right. So my full time job at the time at Montclair State, my full time job, I was a, a corporate fitness trainer personal trainer. And, and that was good. But you know, it wasn't a great livelihood to want to really start my family at the time back then it was different. Um, so I would work my real job five o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning till two, and then I would go be a part time coach from 230 in the afternoon till eight o'clock at night. Um, and then that opportunity came where the cane job opened up and I knew I wanted to get into coaching and I didn't have any kids yet just got married 2001. And wherever this thing took me, you know, I know if you would have told me in 2003 that I would still be at Kane, you know, I would tell you, man, you are fool. You know what? Because my goal was to be a division one coach or bust, you know, until I sat at a clinic and I talk, talked to um, God rest his soul, George DeLeon at a Northeast clinic up in New Jersey. George DeLeon was a longtime Syracuse coach, coaching the NFL for a while, offensive line guru. Um, I sat right in the front. I just I was such, I was 25 years old, maybe 26. And he started at Western Connecticut. So a division three school. So I said, you know, I waited for everyone to leave. And he, I said, Coach, great clinic. I said, you know, I just want to know one thing. How do I get where you are? You know, how do I get to from Montclair State to a Syracuse from the way you did Westcon? And when I put Paul Pasqualoni now at Syracuse for so long, and he said, son, let me tell you something. You work your tail off, right? That's why I just told you. You work your tail off where you are and people are going to take notice. Don't worry about where you are. Just do the best you can where you are. So mm -hmm. that's why I took that job for 29,000 because I love football. I couldn't imagine football in not in my life, you know, and being a policeman is obviously a special, special career. And I, and I respect everyone who does it. My brother was a cop. My uncles were cops. I have great, many great friends who are state troopers and, and a lot of law enforcement agencies, but I knew that I couldn't live without football in my life. I just couldn't do it. Now, coach, after, I want to make sure I get my stats right. After three seasons as the DC, why, how did the opportunity present itself for you to then take the next step and become the head coach? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was the change, the changing of the guard, so to speak. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, the head coach I worked for, we, I left Montclair state with him. Um, I mm -hmm. came here, worked for him as his DC for three years. Um, he was let go. And uh, at the time I'm 29 years old. I only have three years of full-time coaching experience. I've coached, but I was a part-time coach. So what people don't understand, man, when you're part-time, you know, you come to practice, you, you know, you sit in a meeting, you read your script, you coach, and you go home. When you're a full-time mm -hmm. guy, like, especially at our level, you know, I'm sure you talk to many coaches. Uh, I must wear, I got to wear anywhere between 15 to 25 hats on any given day, you know, and, and at three years in, I'm a rookie. I was mm -hmm. blessed to, to them. They took a shot on me. They, you know, didn't even open a job. They just said we have a qualified candidate in house, um, and and the rest is really history. Now, coach, let's talk about the uh, let's talk about your coaching philosophy first, and then we'll yep. go into what the program uh, standards and the pillars and whatnot of the program are. Yep. So my personal philosophy has changed over the years. And I think like any good coach, when you get older, you change perspective and you, and, you, mm -hmm. and things kind of you tweak a little bit. You know, when I was 25, my number one objective was to, to make it to Division One. period. And I wanted to be a Division One coach no matter what it meant. Uh, today, now, today, it's like, and I mean this, it's in our, it's in, um, I teach a class here at Kane called, called um, Scientific Principles of Sport. Um and coaching. And then I also, you know, have it in our manual, like the number one thing for me now being here for year 21 is I want to build men of character. It's not corny. It's not real. I mean, it's not fake. It's real. It's genuine because I've been here so long and, and it's allowed me to see that transition over the years. Now I get 21 years here to, to, to be at people's weddings, you know, as, as recent as last weekend guy I coached or, or guys, you know, send me pictures of their babies and, and they're better men for being in our program, whether that's been a year two years or, or fortunate enough to graduate. They all, you know, the, the, the thing is always the same. They're, they leave better. So that is definitely my personal philosophy. Um, and I want to coach people like I want someone coaching my own kid. 
like, you know, I'm not going to demean you, but I'm going to coach you hard and I'm going to love you up, but it's not always going to be easy either. So, um, you know, having three boys, like that's my personal philosophy in those two areas. And as far as our program, we define it every day in our program. We give our cards a little lamination, uh, give cards out to our kids, lamination sheets. Um, it's a little bit, maybe one by one, two by two. Uh, we laminate it and we have two pillars, right? The first pillar is trust because trust is something that I feel is so hard to earn. Uh, mm-hmm. especially in today's day, day and age, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sound old like my father did when he used to preach, but you know, trust is so hard to earn. It's so easy to screw up. Right. And, and mm-hmm. especially in football and recruiting, um, a lot of people say a lot of things to get a recruit. Right. And we don't do that. And, and I do that from the first interaction. I say that because you might not like what I tell you, but I promise you over the four years, I'm not going to lie to you. It's not going to be mincing the words and trust is everything. And trust covers it all in our program. And then discipline is our second one in our left pillar because discipline is a personal standard to be met. And a lot of people, especially young people, think discipline is punishment. No, discipline isn't punishment. I'm trying to hold you the standard that I've already seen the potential in you to hold you that standard you showed me. So, and then the last one, you know, you know, it's a Greg Shiano thing. It's a Jersey thing, but I, I, I kind of, you know, the SIS, steal ideas strategically. I, I've definitely done that. Family, you know, because forget about me, I love you. I mean, when you have 100 plus guys in a locker room and you only have 11 starters on each side of the ball, and you better be selfless because if it's mm-hmm. about, if you make it about you and if you make it just about your personal ego and your statistics, you know, the team suffers. So, you know, I believe that, that those things are, are very evidently clear every day in our program. And if a young man was in here right now, he'd be able to tell you the same thing. I believe it. Now, coach, what, um, and I want to think of how to word this, uh, put us in the room and you did a little bit just there put us in the room with a recruit and their family what does that discussion go for obviously you need somebody that can play ball You're, that, yeah. that, i mean i don't have to ask you that question a kid got to play ball to come play uh what else are you talking to the to the parents and the and the the prospective student about you know it's it's one resoundingly large point for me and, and again when you do it this long um the first thing i really say outside when we talk about trust because i tell them like when I talk about trust as our pillar, I'm, I'm honest. I say, you, you shouldn't believe a word I tell you today. You shouldn't because trust isn't built in five minutes. It's not built in one visit. It's built over time. And if you come here, you know, the way you build our trust is when the day one we met you, from the day we bring you on campus as a recruit to the first day of preseason camp, everything's going to align. There's not, there shouldn't be anything. So that's the first thing I tell them. You shouldn't trust me. Ask your coach about us. Uh, ask people who may have attended Kane. But then the really the next biggest sounding board is I talk about the right fit. And, and I think that's such a thing that goes untalked about in our, especially at our level, because, you know, division three, is no scholarships, right? So at the end of the day, the right fit financially, it has to be the right fit for their family. If mm-hmm. they can't afford this, right. And it doesn't make sense financially. They might love Kane. They might love coach Garrett. They might love the facilities, but if they don't have the right financial aid package, because, because their EFC number doesn't match up, you know, if it's not the right fit financially, you shouldn't come here. And then yeah. the second, the second prong is, all right, academically, do, do we have what you want to study, right? Because football is only going to last so long. What I really say um, to a lot of guys, like my dad was a plumber and I love my father, right? And me and my brother had a phenomenal childhood, right? My, my father didn't go to college. He, he graduated from high school. He went to trade school and he was a plumber and we had a great life. So the, the college degree is not the end all be all. But if you're going to go to college, I'm a perfect example because academically, I wanted to be an exercise science guy. Mm-hmm. So even though my drive was football, like when you go to school, football is going to end. And because I had that piece of paper when my playing days were over, I was then in, two, in 2003 able to go on an interview to see if I could be a D coordinator at a university, but I needed that piece of paper. So you just don't know what doors that piece of paper is going to open. You know, mm-hmm. so I think first and foremost, it's the right fit financially for your family. Secondly, it's the right fit academically. Do we have the major you want? And then third, right, is the right fit for football. Like we mm-hmm. come here and we're not putting you in a jersey and we're not giving the strobe lights and we're not putting all the pictures out there. You know, if it's not for you, just because we didn't put you in a jersey, it's probably not a right fit because the things we're talking about aren't going to align and, and we're going to butt heads a lot. So is it the mm-hmm. right fit when you come on this visit for what we're offering, what we're talking about? Because what we're trying to do is keep it real with you. We're trying to sell a feeling of of genuine, which, which we are. And, and those three things are really what we talk about, especially with parents and the kids. Now, Coach, you brought up that you got to coach against your mentor. Now, 21 seasons now, is there a little bit extra when you're at Montclair or Montclair comes down the road to you? Is that a little – is that a game that you, like, in your head circle and go, ah, no, 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 we got this one? 
No, I'm going to be honest with you. And people still think that, right? Um, in mm-hmm. the beginning, it was. It was very heated because, again, like there was kids I left in 2003 who I loved. Like mm-hmm. I loved them. Like they were some of the best players I've ever coached. And now I'm coming down here in 2003 fall and I'm lining up against them. You know, so for the first five, six, seven, eight, nine years, I, th- I think it was definitely, you know, it was a heated rival that, you know, if you're going to equate it, you know, I always equated the joke in my family, like it was a Miami, the old school Miami, Florida State. There was always a little something extra there. But over the years, you know, and I don't mean it in just another game because they'll always hold a special place in my heart. Like I played there, I coached there, I was there for 11 years, but it, it was, it was just another game. And I didn't really look at it as the one I'm going to circle. You know, it was just right, wherever they fell on our schedule. Hey, we our goal is to get to one and know this week. Now, some of the guys up there or some of our kids in this locker room still think that's what our biggest rivalry. But for me, hell, I think every game on our schedule in our end jack is a rivalry game. Mm-hmm. Now, it's interesting you bring up the end jack. Let's talk about that. What is the significance of the of of the end jack in comparison to some of the other conferences? You know, we've had the Empire Eight, we've had some Liberty League, where we we actually just got a couple landmark guys. Um, PAC, OAC, where does, where does the NJAC fall into that grouping? You know, I don't know where we fit anymore. I just know when, as a player and as a coach, uh, in this conference, it's 1993, um, you know, we've always held our own, right? So whoever's in the conference and we've had a lot of change and turnover over the years from, you know, those New York schools being in here where Cortland, Brockport, Buffalo state, we transitioned out, we got some West Con, then we transitioned out. We had, you know, then it was Wesley, right? Wesley, mighty old Wesley. God rest his soul. Mike Drass, what a wonderful human being. I became really dear friends with him. And then Frostburg with Delane Fitzgerald, who ends up going to be a Division II school, right? And with Salisbury CNU in Southern Virginia at the time. And now we're just left with Salisbury and um, CNU. Mm-hmm. So I don't know where we stack up anymore. You know, I used to get caught up in that stuff as a younger coach. You know, I think, you know, you, you could put us up, our top team, at least anyway, with some of the, the best teams in the country, you know, you know, depending on the year and obviously and all those things. But, you know, I don't know where we rank. I'm not really big on that anymore. I used to be as a younger guy. Um, but I know that our conference does things a certain way and we have some really good football in this conference. And then to follow up on that, obviously the conference is in Division Three. What's the significance to you? Uh, as a guy that started out in Division Two and then played and has spent uh, since 93, you've been in, in division three, what's yeah. division three mean to you? Uh, I actually start my recruiting talks because again, you're like, where we, as we sit here, right. It, it, it is 2023. And mm-hmm. when you didn't have social media, right. In 1992, as a senior coming out of high school, like you didn't have to worry about putting your camp stuff out there. You didn't have to worry about getting a star ranking. And yeah. now it's like these, poor, these kids, like they got, like, I just had a son go through this recruiting process. Um, just graduated uh, this past June. Uh, fortunate enough, he's at Monmouth University, played Coach Calling, and those guys are awesome. But my point is, like today, these guys, if, if they don't get validated by a Division One offer, they feel like they're below their, you know, mm-hmm. Division Three is below them. They're beneath them. So for me, uh, the first thing I when I introduce myself, I let them all know I'm a proud Division Three guy. I might have started at Division Two, but I, when I say I'm a proud Division Three product, I am a proud Division Three product. Everything I've ever earned in my life has been from 1993 as a young adult, a young man coming out of high school to where I sit today. And it's aborted everything I have in my, in my life from my wife and children, me providing them an opportunity to have a, a nice house, you mm-hmm. know, provide an opportunity for my son to go to college. So I'm a proud division three guy. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Now let's uh, we're going to jump back to last season and then we'll talk yep. about where you feel we're heading down, down the road this season. So uh, let's talk about like, just give us a quick recap of last season and where you felt some of we, you came up short or, or, or yeah. there were some expectations that were met. Yeah. We, we, you know, we thought last year's team would be the one to turn it around. Um, mm-hmm. I think the stat that I came up with when we talked to our team in the, in the winter and going into spring ball is, you know, you sit here, you're three and seven, but let's not lose sight of, you know, and not that close gives you any solace because close doesn't. I just, it's, it's about saying that when you focus on doing the little things and you focus on the attention to detail, like one play here or there, you, you could have won, you, you know, that's the loser's mentality. Could have, should have, would have, but there was legitimately four games. We lost by a total of 17 points, mm-hmm. you know? So when you look at that, you're talking about one play, you know, you miss a field goal, you get a punt blocked special teams isn't a playoff you know those things matter because if you win those two games where you don't you don't miss field goals and you don't get a punt block like we had a punt block with you know under a minute left against merchant marine academy you know our defense you know at that that game held merchant marine academy to a ridiculously low amount of rushing yards and they only had seven points but a block punt and you lose nine seven in my opinion in any level of sports when you start stringing losses together 
it's mm-hmm. really hard when you have quality opponents to keep your team in belief and have confidence. So all those close games, the sounding board, like we thought that team was going to turn around. We didn't we didn't succeed on the field on the scoreboard. But I got to be honest with you, man, I couldn't have been any more proud of that locker room. I mean, every Sunday we had our team meet and they fought. They kept coming back. They didn't they didn't hang their tails. They kept working and they stayed together. No one was pointing fingers. Not one week, not ever. And, and I think in this world, that's hard to do. You know, yeah. because when you're not playing and you're sitting in a locker room as one of 80 guys who's not the starter, it's be very easy to point a finger. You know, mm-hmm. we never had that. And we stayed together. And that's probably one of the most proud things I am most proud of in my last 20 years here um, to keep that team together. And it wasn't me. That's leadership, man. We, we had we had seniors who kept it together. There, there was juniors in there who kept it together. I mean, everyone from player one to 105, mm-hmm. they all kept it together. So, I mean, that that it was tough. But, we you know, the expectations now, you know, College football is funny, especially at every level now, right? The transfer portal and all these things. Like, I don't know if there's, you know, the life expectancy of a college football team is longer than one year anymore. That's true. You know, so that, that's kind of our thing. Like, all right, man, last season's over. Our season mm-hmm. started last January. Like, we had a great winter workouts. Uh, we had a great weight room. We had a phenomenal – we have spring ball now. We're in helmets three days a week and uppers once a week. Uh, we don't go against each other, but we had great football technique. And those tension in the details and focus on those little things, you know, we're hoping those things add up to, to make the close games the games that we win, mm-hmm. you know. And then what's the message to the fan base, the alumni coming into this 2023 season? Yeah, it's a new team. It, it is vastly different. Um, we have a lot of guys that you wouldn't have heard of before because our defense last year was absolutely loaded with, mm-hmm. with some some guys who've been there three, four years, from Keon Taylor, our, our All-American corner, to to Aaron Cottrell, who played like an All-American every week. Uh, we had and on and on and on, like Anthony Bassani, who's not here anymore. Like, we just had a ton. Josh Harris, a D-lineman. But we have guys who've been there who are ready. They might not have the game experience, but they're mature. We're a little older on that side of all. We don't have to play freshmen and sophomores. Um, mm-hmm. So I would say, and same thing on offense, you know, the guys in the offensive line now have been together three, four years, you know, so they were young, you know, last year and the year before, but they're not young anymore. And there's continuity there. Uh, our quarterback now, right now in camp is, is going to be a second year starter. Um, we have some transfers in at some different spots on the offensive side of the ball. So it's a new team and it's a new year and we're super excited And day three in the camp. You know, I couldn't ask for anything different than what we have right now in this trajectory we're on with how practices has gone, meetings have gone. You know, our walkthroughs have gone. We're locked in. We're focused. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not even going to jinx us with anything else because I don't want to say anything <laughs> that isn't hasn't been negative because I am superstitious and I knock on wood for everything. So right now it's going every way that I want it to go as a head coach. Coach, what has kept you coming back for 21 years? Yeah, you know, there's definitely been opportunities. Um, you know, I've had plenty of opportunities over the years uh, from Division two schools where my buddy coached in northern Michigan. Uh, mm-hmm. dear friend of mine in the Ivy League. You know, there's been some some, some opportunities to really go ahead and do it. Um, you know, it goes back to what my core values are outside of football. You know, my family. My family is everything to me. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife's a teacher. Uh, my three boys, I didn't want them living out of a suitcase. So could I have gone to a northern Michigan and, and been to D.C. for $50,000 and, and maybe what happens next? Maybe. I know the guy who took that D coordinator job is not a head coach at Navy but I didn't want to travel the country. That's a crapshoot, man. Like mm-hmm. I didn't want to do that. You know, I didn't want my family moving to Michigan and then three years we're getting fired and I'm looking for a job and everything we know is in New Jersey. So, you know, I made it not about me. It wasn't, it's not about me ever. It's not even about me here. Uh, and I think that's the biggest thing that's kept me here. Um, sure. Would I love to coach division one and, and have the resources and the financial <laughs> stability to offer a kid a scholarship and not, not recruit a 1300 kids to get 30. And then mm-hmm. when you recruit those 30 and they say they're coming, 26 show up the first day of camp. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I would love all that, but it's not about me. It, it's not about me as a man. You know, we, we have a saying around here, you know, don't be the man, be a man. And a man mm-hmm. has responsibilities and you have to be, you know, accountable for your actions and inactions. And, and it's never been about me. It's been about my family talking about that. That's why I stayed because they didn't have to travel around the country. Uh, coach, so that we come to this part, this is just about you. There's no football questions involved. It's a rapid fire. There's six questions here. Let's go. Uh, the first one, and I think you just answered it. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Well, if we're taking away football anywhere in the world, I'll tell you what, man. Uh, Switzerland was gorgeous. Lucerne, Switzerland was absolutely beautiful. Crystal blue waters, a rocky mountain, white mountains. I mean, I, I mean, that place was gorgeous. I went there when I was in Germany. That I would love to go back there. Wow. Uh, what's the most important lesson that you've learned over your career? And I think you touched on it a little bit when you were talking about your philosophy. 
Yeah. You know, in the end of the day, it's not about me. Even as a head coach, it's, it's, it's never about me. I try to avoid the word I a lot around here. If I'm talking to my team, it's us. We, I don't need, you know, even my coaching staff, I don't want to, it's not about me because this place was here well before me. It's going to be here after me. I might be the head coach of this team, but the program, these, the, you know, the program is student, but these guys, they run the team every year. You mm -hmm. know, it's their locker room. I'm just the head coach. I'm the figure. Where did you meet your wife? Montclair state. She was a field hockey player. I was a football player. Um, during college, I used to bounce, um, be a security at a bar. She came in here one night. I happened to hear she played field hockey. I talked to her friend. The next thing you know, the rest is history. We're married. Here Coach, we I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm surprised that with, with what you said, your height and weight was coming out of high school, you fit the mold of the, what, what we're looking for in the bouncer. Yeah. And look back then, I don't know how she fell in love with me. I, I had a shaved head. I had this goatee thing that was nasty looking. I might've had an earring or two, but that's off record. Of course. <laughs> Uh, if you weren't coaching, what would you be doing? Well, you know, if I weren't coaching, I probably went in that police academy in 2003, and I'd probably mm -hmm. be getting ready for retirement right now. Those cops have a 20-year retirement plan. I'd probably be getting ready to go move somewhere. Uh, what's the best compliment you've ever received? Um, man, there's so many, uh, and, and it's usually from a parent. Um, you know, when, when their sons are done playing for me, uh, whether it's an email down the road or a text message because their son gave me their number, um, just saying what an incredible impact you've had on my son's life and, and seeing him, you know, I'm talking to you, I'm getting choked up for crying out loud. Um, that, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll lighten it up for you. The other yeah. side of compliments, what's the best insult you've oh. ever received? <laughs> it, you know, the, the, the worst one, like I, I wear a double headset now for a reason. You know, so I don't hear people in the stands, um, you know, but it might have been uh, might have been an, an anonymous letter that absolutely attacked my character because their son wasn't playing the quarterback position when um, the kid who was playing quarterback at the time was our best quarterback. He has all the records in the world in our, in our record book, 2011, Tom Lee and Breezy. So that might have been the worst attack in my character. And then the last question, I've asked every coach this question at the end of the show. Was there yeah. a question that you were expecting? And if so, how would you have answered it? If there was a question that I was expecting, um, honestly, you know, I thought you would have said, how's your team going to be this year? Right. And how are we going to be this year? That's going to be determined by how well we do in camp. You know, mm -hmm. we, we have to we have to elevate the floor every day. Uh, we can't be happy with status quo. Uh, every day that we go to work, you know, easy is always going to be there to wipe away yesterday's hard work. So, you know, I have a blue collar mentality. I told you my, my dad was a plumber. My mom was a Catholic school teacher. Uh, I was raised, you know, with, with a, with a, with a lunch pail in my hand. You know, we, we went to work. I delivered newspapers as a little boy back in the day when I had mm -hmm. those things, riding my bicycle, collecting things. So you got to work, you know, and every day we got to go to work and, and whether you like it or whether you want to, it's not about your feelings. You got to put your feelings aside, tuck them away. And, and that's, that question will be answered is yet to be determined because it depends how hard this group works over the next two weeks before we, we get into game week. Well, coach, I don't want to keep you any longer. I know it's that time of year and meetings and whatnot. I want to say thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. Um, and then for those of you sticking around, you know, what comes up next. It's overtime with Serenity Brown, where she tells me all the things I messed up in this episode. And I ask her a question that she has no answer for. So uh, coach, best of luck this year in 2023. This has been coach Dan Garrett of, Keen University, and we will be right back. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carla Guadagnino. Welcome back. This is Overtime with Serenity Brown. That's her. Uh, just finished up with Coach Garrett, Keen University. Uh, big game coming up this week for them. We'll get to them. They're our game of the week. Um, Got to update the standings here. We did the math with a calculator. Uh, DB sitting at 62 and 18 comfortably in the lead. Uh, you had another big week, jumping into second place, 59 and 21. I am also 59 and 21, but because I did not have the week that you have, I put myself in third place, even though we are tied. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, or listening and watching on Spotify, we really appreciate you. Uh, tell a friend to tell a friend, and also make sure you get on to social media. So it's Twitter, Instagram, oh, sorry, Twitter's now X, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. The only one that's different is the Instagram page. That's dingo underscore talk. You had something to say, it looked like. No? Like you were in the middle there. I looked over and you were like. He reads brains now. <laughs> we're going to do our predictions now. Okay. All right. Game one. Number nine, Linfield versus Pacific. 
Everybody picked the same game. Winfield. Game two, DePaul versus Kenyon. Everybody picked the same game. DePaul. Number three, Lake Forest versus, and I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I want to say Deloitte. Well, Beloit. Oh, Beloit. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a B. It's, um, I, dyslexic, sorry. DB and I picked Lake Forest. You picked Bel Beloit. Beloit. Uh, next up is number 22, Grove City versus the Fighting Bison of Bethany College. Grove City. Grove City. <laughs> Washington and Lee versus number 10, Randolph Macon. And we all took Randolph Macon. Mm -hmm. Uh, interesting, there's a split here. The ranked team you went with, which is Del Val, number 25 in the country, DB and I, took Stevenson. This is a maker, this is a make or break week for me at least. DB can really just DB's run gonna, away. With DB's it. not even on the show and he's gonna win this somehow. Uh well he's been here from the beginning. Yeah, but next game is Springfield versus Merchant Marine. Once again, this is a different game. You picked Merchant Marine. And DB and I picked Springfield. Next up is number three, Wartburg versus Central. We all chose Wartburg. Another big shakeup here. Number eight, Johns Hopkins. They moved up two spots, jumping a couple people. Um, versus number 21, Muhlenberg. And you took Muhlenberg. And we took Johns Hopkins. And then in our game of the week, uh, DB and I took a page out of Serenity's book. Um, we all took Franklin and Marshall um, for that specific game. I just want to say, you know, had to do a little, little shake up here. And with me picking so many games different than you and DB, I got to say that this, this week will either really put me ahead or really put you back. Or, or <laughs> we'll I'm be waving at you. We'll just be waving at you. But that being said, the fact that you have picked 59 games is is great because you don't look at standings, you don't look at records. I just I'm guessing. You just pick. I, 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 hope I, I that look there's... at the, I look at the names and I get a vibe. And on that note, we're gonna we're gonna vibe check our way out of here is what we're gonna do. So. Uh, just so you guys know, we have a great November and a great December coming up. Uh, everywhere from athletic directors, a couple guy, uh, a guy from a different D3 podcast. And, of course, we're going to wrap up with the coaches for Season 3. Hope you'll stick around. Uh, but that's, that's all for us this weekend. Again, have a happy and safe Halloween. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, which gives you a lot of leeway. Enjoy. Thanks for checking out this episode of Dingo Talk. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. For more info and to contact the show, you can find us on Twitter at Dingo Talk.